It seems these days there's almost no problem some computer can't or won't be able to solve in due time. However, this is not at all true. Sometimes a problem is just practically impossible for a classical computer to ever solve, either because it would take ridiculous amounts of time or because it would need absurd amounts of memory. To solve some of these hard problems, we need a fundamentally different approach to computation, and that is just what quantum computers offer. So, what is a quantum computer and how does it work? Let's start with classical computers and see how we can turn them into quantum computers. Any classical computation can be reduced to a circuit in which logical gates act on bits. These bits carry information in a discrete, binary fashion, while gates read the state of the input bits and give an according output. Quantum computers can also be described as circuits through the so-called quantum circuit model. This means that we take our bits and our gates and make them quantum. Let's start with the bits. A bit is always in one of two states, 0 or 1, like a coin can be in either heads or tails. A quantum bit or qubit is now a quantum two-level system, which means it can be in any proportion of the states 0 and 1 at the same time. This is called superposition, and you can think of it as a spinning coin. While it's spinning, the coin is in heads and tails at the same time. On the other hand, measuring a qubit is like stopping the coin, making it heads or tails and destroying the superposition. The probability of getting 0 or 1 when measuring the qubit depends on its state before the measurement. Superposition is very important, because now our inputs can be in all possible states at once. Because of this, a quantum computer only needs to run some algorithms once to test all possible inputs. Superposition also increases the amount of information carried in a qubit. With n qubits, one can store as much as 2 to the n classical bits worth of information. This means that to store the information of just 300 qubits, we need more bits than there are atoms in the universe. What about the gates? Well, we need our gates to act on qubits, whose state can be seen as a point in a sphere surface. A quantum gate will then be a sequence of rotations that take us from one point of the sphere to another. You might see how there are infinitely many points on this sphere and infinite ways of going from one point to another. Fortunately, we don't need to perform all these operations. In fact, with some small sets of gates, called universal, we can approximate any possible operation in an efficient way. So, with qubits and quantum gates we can construct our quantum computer. Do we have one already? The answer is yes, but it's still very primitive. Qubits are very sensitive, which means that their control needs to be very precise and their interaction with the environment kept to a minimum. As of now, errors are still prevalent, and so understanding what is going on is vital if we want to improve our quantum computer's performance. To do this, we need reliable characterization techniques. The state-of-the-art characterization technique is called gate-set tomography. It tries to describe a unknown process by feeding it different prepared input states and characterizing its outputs. The problem is that both the state preparation and the measurement are also imperfect processes, and so they need to be characterized as well. At the end of the day, this means that we are trying to characterize all the gates in a quantum black box at once. In this box, we can only program different sequences of faulty gates that act on a single input state, and get a binary measurement output in which we can completely trust. Sounds complicated? It certainly is, but it is not impossible. Characterizing the operations in the IBM quantum processors using gate-set tomography will be the main focus of my work. The results will uncover existing imperfections in these devices and hopefully help in improving them.